This program is brought to you by the combined resources of the Wisconsin Historical Society and Wisconsin Public Television. On Wisconsin Hometown Stories, a town founded on the Mississippi River, built up by the wealth of a great pine forest, and rebuilt after an economic collapse. A city transformed by higher education, a medical revolution, and the rivers that run through it. On Wisconsin Hometown Stories, La Crosse. Principal funding was provided by Don and Roxanne Weber, Gail K. Cleary and the Cleary Cum Foundation, Charles and Sue Ann Gillat, and continuing their rich history of community support, Quick Trip, founded in La Crosse in 1965 and serving the needs of customers in neighborhood stores across Wisconsin and beyond. Additional support by Gunderson Lutheran Health System, Dahl Automotive of La Crosse and Unalaska, Sigurd B. Gunderson, Jr., Friends of Wisconsin Public Television, and the Wisconsin History Fund, supported in part by the National Endowment for the Humanities. In 1805, Lieutenant Zebulon Pike, sent on an expedition to explore the Mississippi River, stopped at a sand prairie that French explorers called Prairie La Crosse. Came up Prairie La Crosse, so named for the ball game played on it by the Sioux. This prairie is very handsome. It is bordered by hills, similar to those of the Prairie du Chien. Climbing a tall bluff, Pike was overcome by what he saw. It is altogether a prospect so varied and romantic that man may scarcely expect to enjoy such a one, but twice or thrice in the course of a life. La Crosse, Wisconsin. The city that sprang up on that prairie today retains the beauty that so struck Zebulon Pike. La Crosse is situated on the banks of the Mississippi and in the middle of uh, the Driftless region, uh, the unglaciated region of southwestern Wisconsin. A topography created basically by erosion as the glaciers retreated. And so it is contrary to the Midwest's image, much more rugged. Like practically every other river city, um, La Crosse sits on a sandy alluvial plain formed by the juncture of the Mississippi, the Black River, and the La Crosse River. The confluence of the three rivers gave life to the city. The Black River, its banks lined with valuable white pine, brought in great wealth. The Valley of the La Crosse provided a route through the hills for the railroads and the Mississippi brought commerce, a lifeline to the rest of the world, and gave the city its identity as a river town. In 1841, Nathan Myrick borrowed a government keelboat at Prairie du Chien, filled it with a stock of goods, and with three passengers, pulled his way up the Mississippi to Prairie La Crosse. He was a New Yorker and came west and then heard about this Prairie La Crosse site, thought it lent itself well to the kind of trade he wanted to get into. When he built a trading post, Myrick became the first European settler of Prairie La Crosse. Myrick's account books show that he was an Indian trader, exchanging goods for silver and furs with the Ho-Chunk, who remained in the area they called Hinuquas. 
the settlement grew slowly. After 10 years, La Crosse consisted of five houses, a warehouse, and a long shed used as a bowling alley. But soon after, Frederica Levy, who lived in the little settlement, wrote that settlers came in with a rush, drawn by the prospects of the huge pine forest to the north. Some of the earliest lumbering in this area was done by the Mormons, and they were getting logs and lumber from farther up on the Black River, up toward Black River Falls, and that lumber was to be used for the construction of buildings in Nauvoo, Illinois. And then in 1852, the Federal Land Office moved from Mineral Point, and it was there because of the mines, to La Crosse because of the timber. So as soon as the government began opening these pine lands, lumbering took off furiously. The supplying of goods and food and everything else to the, the whole logging slash lumbering operation was a huge business. La Crosse became a busy steamboat port, taking in goods to haul up to the lumber camps and sawmills to the north. From the period of 1840s up through the late 60s, maybe the 70s, I can hardly imagine La Crosse without the steamboats. And steamboats, let's face it, have a romantic appeal that few other historical objects do. They're noisy, they're dramatic when they move. The most popular type of boat was the packet. This was the pickup truck on the river a big pickup truck, because it carried passengers, but it would carry anything else that you wanted. The passengers were primarily on one of the upper decks, there could be two or three of them, but down on the main deck could be sacked wheat going downstream, it could be coal, it could be farm implements, hogs, cattle, hay, lead, anything at all that needed moving could be put onto a boat. And they were the carrier of choice, almost of necessity, for a long while. On the Black River, lumbermen floated whole logs through the river's sharp turns and rapids. They began to build steam-powered mills in La Crosse and nearby Onalaska to turn the logs into lumber. Raftsmen would then ride the wood to market steering rafts of boards with the current down the Mississippi. As the city of La Crosse developed, builders ran into evidence of earlier residents. Almost immediately as people begin to build buildings and dig into the riverfront, they begin to find artifacts from people who've been here before. Don't really know what they are, have no idea how old they are. Tracings of images from the walls of rock shelters provide early signs of a people now known as the Oneota, who made their homes on the river terraces of the La Crosse area. From 1300 AD to 1600 AD, La Crosse, Wisconsin, and Onalaska, Wisconsin, was the most densely populated place on the entire upper Mississippi River. There were more people here than anywhere from St. Louis up to Minneapolis, St. Paul, and beyond. In the 1920s and 30s, archaeologists from the Milwaukee Public Museum explored sites in western Wisconsin and found artifacts that began to define the Oneota culture. But astounding discoveries about the Oneota were uncovered in 1978 with the construction of the Valley View Mall in La Crosse. The Dayton Hudson Corporation agreed to let archaeologists salvage what they could of a site that local collectors knew to be rich in artifacts. Round stains indicated the location of pits used first by the Oneota to store their food and afterwards, their garbage. And each pit is like a time capsule, so it has pottery and stone arrowheads and, and charcoal and bone tools and things like that. And we could do radiocarbon dates from those pits and begin to reconstruct the lifeways and the chronology and, and all sorts of things about the Oneota culture that we never knew before. 
They had a very sophisticated culture. Uh, they were very productive uh, farmers uh, in the truest sense of the word, not just having little gardens, but large agricultural fields. They were involved in, in trade networks that stretched just about all over the continental United States. Uh, had large populations, large villages of, of 100, 200 uh, acres. The richness of the finds at Valley View led to the formation of the Mississippi Valley Archaeology Center at UW-La Crosse to document the archaeology of the area before it was destroyed by development. The Oneota, just like us, knew where good places uh, are to live. And so every time a new highway was going in or a new school or any kind of, of development, that's where there'd be another site. You put them all together and you, find, and you try to trace the boundaries of, the, of, of these things and they just all tied together. The Oneota occupied from the south end of La Crosse all the way up to the city of Onalaska, which is in the north, and then extended all the way up to Trempolo, which is 15 miles from here. These are my ancestors. These are the people that preceded me. My family is tied to that area. I have aunts and uncles and cousins that still live in La Crosse in, this, in, in the surrounding area. And we've had people there for untold generations. My great-grandfather was with me until I was a sophomore in, in high school. And he related stories that his grandfather had told him about the La Crosse area, that as they used to travel in those valleys, and especially in the evenings when they were on the river, that they would look up the river and there was smoke coming down from all of what we now call coolies, the valleys. And the reason that smoke was there, it wasn't fog, it was actually smoke from all the villages. That was the concentration that was there of people. You stand on the bluffs above La Crosse, hundreds of feet above what is now the city of La Crosse. It's one of the most beautiful areas in the United States, I'd argue in the world. It, it's bountiful, it's rich, it's green, it's clean. It just reinforces what's been going on there for hundreds and thousands of years. It's not just Indian history, it's not just Ho-Chunk history, but it becomes a part of who we are as a community. This is part of the history of the people of La Crosse, and the people of La Crosse are not just the people that are standing vertical today. The people of La Crosse are the people that have been there for thousands and thousands of years. Oneota culture, and yes, even before that. Steam engines still pass through La Crosse a few times a year, a reminder of a time when steamboats, steam engines, and steam-powered sawmills drove the economy. In 1858, the Milwaukee and La Crosse Railroad tunneled through the hills near Toma and following the La Crosse River Valley, reached the newly incorporated city of La Crosse. The impact of the railroads on the city would be profound. They would challenge the steamboat for control of shipping, trigger a radical reshaping of the Mississippi River, and lay the groundwork for an economic boom. The railroad uh, was what truly opened up this region to uh, many more people. After the Civil War, a surge of immigrants arrived, drawn by the lure of jobs in the lumber industry. It just expanded so rapidly and hired so many people. And the lumber companies moved in. They saw this as a good way to get rich quick, and it was. And they began advertising, sending broadsides to European countries, especially Scandinavia, indicating that there were great jobs here and work that they knew how to do. And so that was not only a major economic force locally, but it was a major immigration force as well. An awful lot of trees were floating by this place and floating down to this place. 
at one point, um, 1870s and 80s, there were 33 sawmills in La Crosse stretching along the Black River and along the Mississippi. Steamboats lost a lot of business to the railroads and began to specialize. Many became raft boats, pushing the ever-growing rafts of logs and lumber to market. To see the photos of these log rafts coming down either the Black River or the Mississippi River, it's unbelievable the amount uh, of lumber that was being moved. If you look to our west, to Iowa, Minnesota, uh, the Dakotas, uh, the barns there were built with Wisconsin trees uh, and Wisconsin lumber. The lumber industry produced great fortunes, and a number of large homes, still maintained today, display the wealth generated by the lumber barons. In the 1850s, lumberman Gideon Hickson built what is now called the Hickson House, a museum maintained by the La Crosse County Historical Society. Gideon Hickson was one of the early settlers of La Crosse, came here in 1856, and when Hickson came to La Crosse, he went into the lumber business and made his money in white pine. The house is a step back into the life of a prominent early family, authentically restored with original furnishings. When the society was given the house in the early 1960s, it came with the furniture. For years, lumber barons fought the building of this bridge across the Black and Mississippi rivers because it would block the movement of their lumber rafts. That didn't stop the railroads, however, from going across. There were railroad ferries. You could take two or three railroad cars across and then put them on their way. In the wintertime, if the ice was thick enough, you laid tracks on the ice. And ran your railroad, not the full length of the train by any means, but several cars at a time. Because white pine floats, pushing the logs downriver was relatively easy. Steamboats had a much harder time carrying grain and other heavy freight on the free-flowing and often shallow Mississippi. The earliest descriptions of the upper Mississippi unlike anything you would see today. It was a river that had rapids in it. It was a river that, if you were in a boat in it, uh, you couldn't see the bluffs most of the time. You knew they were there, but you couldn't see them because the river was so choked with islands, and those islands covered with trees, and there were so many different channels, some of them dead end, and some of them blocked by sandbars, others open. You had a huge range of a river that might be uh... 10, 12, 15 feet deep at some point to a river that you could wade across without getting your knees wet. And in those low drought periods, low water periods, steamboat traffic didn't move. And you took your chances out there. A lot of boats were wrecked. If they hit a log or a stump in the water and punctured the hull, that would be the end of that trip right there. In the early years, in the 1830s and 40s, a boat might live three or four years on average. But with each passing decade, boat life got longer. And it's because very quickly the steamboat companies were lobbying Congress to improve the harbors and improve the river. So in 1866, Congress authorizes the first project to begin reshaping the Mississippi River. It's called a four-foot channel project. And what the Congress wanted the Corps of Engineers to do was to create a continuous deep channel all the way from St. Paul to St. Louis. And they're going to do that by dredging out the sandbars and trying to pull out all the snags in the Mississippi River. While river traffic struggled, the railroads finally succeeded in building a bridge across the Mississippi, a symbol of the growing power of the railroads. Trains now shipped even heavy and bulky freight, like farmers' crops. The river has a hard time competing with railroads because farmers' crops become ripe in the fall, just when the river goes to its lowest stage. 
So farmers are kind of stuck going with railroads even if they charge more. And they really become the primary proponents of another project that's finally authorized in 1878 called the four and a half foot channel. It sounds, you know, not a lot different than the four foot channel. It's only a half foot more. What, what's the big deal? Well, the big deal is that this is going to be the first project to fundamentally transform the Mississippi River. This project will change the river like no force since the glaciers. What the Corps of Engineers starts to do is they start building these wing dams in the river. They're long, narrow piers of rock and brush, layer upon layer, that stick out into the river. And they work like the nozzle of a garden hose that's being tightened down. The tighter you, you turn down the nozzle on the hose, the faster the water moves. So as the wing dams narrow the river, they can cut through those sandbars. River improvements, the railroads, and the booming lumber business drove other industrial development in La Crosse, based on processing the area's rich natural resources. Boat yards used the plentiful wood supplies to build and maintain La Crosse's fleet of steamboats, the biggest on the Upper Mississippi. Gathering the harvest of the area's farms, La Crosse became a flour milling and grain shipping center. Early breweries also processed grain and stored beer in caves like this one, carved into a bluff in 1864. Harvesting natural resources uh, and then processing them, that was the nature of, of La Crosse's economy into the 1890s. So long as the resources held out, that was the business of the community, and uh, that's how the city grew. As the city grew, its prospects attracted a young doctor from Norway named Adolf Gunderson and medical care in the city would soon undergo a revolution. The story goes that he saw an ad in a medical journal put there by a, a man he knew in medical school named Christian Christensen. And Christensen was looking for a partner because he'd got too busy. And Christensen was in La Crosse. The frontier city Gunderson found was much rougher than the one he left. He was used to Oslo, which is, a, after all, a capital city, and La Crosse was not. <laughs> La Crosse was known for sawmills, and there were about an equal number of hotels that were of a dubious reputation, some of them, and there were about five breweries. So the culture here was pretty rough. Lumberjacks, steamboat workers, lumber raftsmen, railroad men, hardworking and tough men, often with time on their hands and money in their pockets, frequented the waterfront. It was a rowdy town. The jails were busy, a lot of brawling down on the waterfront. Adding to social friction was the mix of nationalities. The largest immigrant groups, the Germans and Norwegians, lived and worked with Yankee settlers, African Americans, Bohemians, Syrians, Lebanese, Greeks, Irish, British, French, and others. You have this mix of people all being thrown together, sometimes with intense rivalry for jobs and a lot of alcohol consumed in those days. Despite his extensive training in Norwegian medical school, Gunderson received little respect from La Crosse citizens. They had little regard for doctors. So they had little regard for him. Gunderson complained in letters home that he received no more respect than a doctor two blocks away who called himself White Beaver and spent part of his time performing in Wild West shows. It was true, at a time when Americans were fascinated by tales of the Wild West, Buffalo Bill Cody brought his melodrama Prairie Waif to the La Crosse Opera House and his good friend Frank White Beaver Powell performed in the cast. Frank Powell learned herbal medicine from his mother, the granddaughter of a Seneca Indian chief, and attended two years of medical college at a time when no license was required to practice medicine. When White Beaver moved to La Crosse in 1881, 
His adventures as an army doctor with Buffalo Bill were already part of dime novels and plays. In the dime novels and things, he was written up as a frontiersman. He was supposed to be involved with the capture of Sitting Bull. The flamboyant doctor added to his own legend by fabricating stories about himself. He paid newspapers 50 cents a line to run news stories he had written about the success of his cures and surgeries. Powell became the most famous man in town, and his practice, due to his heavy self-promotion and advertising, thrived. There were a lot of people who just said he was, he was an outstanding uh, doctor. He was able to cure things that no one else was able to cure. Some people thought he had magical powers. But then again, uh, Frank Powell was a person who liked to uh, embellish himself. And so it's not always known really the whole truth about the stories of Frank Powell. White Beaver transferred his popularity to the political arena and easily won election as the mayor of La Crosse and served four terms. Mayor Powell threw a 4th of July picnic for all the city's children and welcomed the visits of his friend Buffalo Bill, who brought his Wild West show to town. Buffalo Bill would come to La Crosse and do a few shows. They were very good friends. And that's when Buffalo Bill invested into Frank Powell's uh, medicine company here. So then they were both really marketing these medicines. White Beaver manufactured his own patent medicines, combinations of different herbal treatments. He practiced with herbs. He would put on the bottle, like, take so many drops, and if it didn't work, take so many more. The problem is that uh, most of the uh, mixture was either alcohol or opium and alcohol. Or, and so, uh, of course, it, after a while, it always made you feel good. In Norway, Adolf Gunderson studied for seven years at a university medical school. After that, he spent time observing prominent European surgeons of the day, acquiring the knowledge and skills to carry out the latest innovations in surgery. Other doctors elsewhere, uh, pioneers, were figuring out that there, this, there was such a thing as appendicitis and uh, that this abscess which formed down in the uh, lower right of, ab of the abdomen was due to the inflamed appendix. That was a, a, a revelation. And, uh, and Adolf latched onto this pretty fast. He, he knew that was true. He was reputed to have had a hundred or more successful appendectomies in a, in a row. Uh, which made him something of a legend out there. If you're going to have a surgeon cut into your body, which was still a fairly novel idea, and he has 100% success, that's very good. And, and a ruptured appendix, not only was painful, but it could kill you. The train that would deliver patients right to the Lutheran Hospital came right to the back door. <laughs> so they called that the Appendicitis Express. In La Crosse, A. Gunderson, as he was called, found the freedom to advance far beyond what he could have done in Norway. In Europe, the young men didn't have much freedom. Where here, he, he had a lot of freedom. He liked that. He also was a pioneer in other things here, in prostate surgery, in uh, surgery for ectopic pregnancy. He was aggressive. He was an aggressive surgeon. He believed in doing. And technically extremely capable. I have a great picture of a man who uh, had a big parotid tumor on the side of his head. And he went down to Chicago to see some people down there who were great surgeons. And they said, well, if we operate on that, she'll bleed to death. He came back here and A. Gunderson took it off. And this guy uh, lived for a long time after that. And the family, when he died, sent me this picture to record what, the, what he'd done. He was known as, a, as an aggressive, uh, authoritarian man. The nurses just ran when they saw him coming. If they felt everything wasn't just perfect on their floors, <laughs> they would hide in the closet, for instance, because, you know, and you get the picture, he was so tough on everybody. 
and uh, <clears throat> even on patients too. If they didn't do what he told them, what he wanted them to do or told them to do, then he just dismissed them. Soon after he arrived in La Crosse, Adolf returned to Norway to marry his childhood sweetheart, Helga Isaacsater. And then he talked her into coming back to La Crosse. Amazing, because she was a teacher and she really loved Norway. And then they had this big family beginning right away. You know, they had eight children and uh, all boys, except at last, a girl. <laughs> but she uh, was energetic as a devil. And my father would tell you that she had more energy than any of her children. She would wear them all out by doing what she did. A phenomenal person. Of the family's seven sons, six became physicians. So they all went off to good medical schools, Columbia, Harvard, then headed back here after that. There were two that didn't come back, four that did. His sons convinced Adolf to move out of his crowded second floor office downtown. And finally he agreed to move and build a new clinic, and they built it right next to the hospital. And they moved in in 1930, right in the beginning of the Depression. And in the cornerstone out there, the paper talks about the crash of the stock market. And so they used to put their cars out in front so it looked like they were busy. After weathering the hard times, the family went on to form one of the first group practices. And the multi-specialty clinic would continue to grow eventually becoming a regional medical center. In the years since he arrived in the rough lumber town, Adolf Gunderson helped to bring revolutionary advances in medical care to La Crosse. And during that time, the city would undergo equally profound changes. In the 1880s, mills in La Crosse and Onalaska churned out what seemed to be unlimited amounts of lumber. The peak point of lumber production in La Crosse was 1892. In that peak year, La Crosse sawmills cut 242 million board feet, the equivalent of a 12-inch wide board 45,000 miles long. It was a rate of harvest that would soon destroy the resource. The pineries became pretty much exhausted, and that rollover period was very abrupt. The age of, of lumbering really ended quickly, to the point where the industry itself literally crashed. As La Crosse headed into the 20th century without the industry that built it, the city searched for ways to reinvent itself. Well, I like to think of it as adaptation. And my definition of being alive is to be able to adapt. In the decades to come, the city of La Crosse would become more industrial, creating large manufacturing businesses. It would establish new educational institutions and become a college town and new conflicting visions of the Mississippi would both restore and radically reshape the river. The city's rebuilding began with industries that grew up with the frontier economy. The railroads became the city's largest employers. There were now five rail lines in town, two of them with division headquarters and repair shops. We had over 4,000 railroad employees and we had manufacturing in part because of the railroads. And we had some big businesses for the early part of the 20th century. Manufacturers like the La Crosse Plow Company continued to grow, turning out an assortment of farm implements. They shipped their plows west of the Mississippi. And the railroads west of the Mississippi were essential to their success. In 1929, the La Crosse Plow Company merged with a national corporation, Alice Chalmers, and would build implements for their popular line of tractors for the next 40 years.
In 1884, the city's five breweries produced as much beer as Milwaukee, and brewing became a major industry. When the John Gund Brewery burned down, Gund rebuilt a huge facility, the biggest in the city. Reputed to be larger than Anheuser-Busch at the end of World War I, it owned and controlled more saloon sites than Anheuser-Busch. And saloon sites were the unfilling stations of the brewery industry. Nearby, the city brewery was run by the widow of Gottlieb Heilemann. Johanna Heilemann was one of the first, if not the first, female CEO in, in the country. And after he died, instead of turning the company over to, to, to someone else, she ran it, and she ran it very well. From the Heilemann home and office, Johanna incorporated the business as the G. Heilemann Brewing Company. And soon, her sons-in-law developed a new brand of beer they called Old Style. To start a new industry, a group of city investors pooled their resources to build the La Crosse Rubber Mills, which manufactured raincoats, sneakers, and rubber boots. After several expansions, the large plant employed a thousand people and was capable of producing 30,000 pairs of shoes and overshoes a day. Walking to school, I had overshoes. And they were difficult to put on, almost as hard to put on as long underwear. Like many cities, La Crosse hitched its fortunes to the emerging automobile industry and developed some large local companies. The Northern Engraving Company, a metal decorating firm, took over White Beaver Powell's former medical office and began to make dial faces for another lacrosse business, the National Gauge Company, which became a leading maker of gauges for cars. National Gauge eventually merged with Electric Autolite, a national maker of auto parts, though it was still known locally as the gauge plant. Heat and pressure indicators, instruments for the control panels of modern motor cars. The biggest company in La Crosse grew from a small plumbing supply business run by Norwegian immigrant James Train. When Train's son Ruben returned from engineering school, they formed the Train Company to market a steam heating system which included Ruben's design for a new kind of steam trap. And he told me that in 1916 he traveled the country by rail and visited a hundred towns and he was a congenial gentleman and a good salesman as well as an engineer. He sold them on his trap. He began manufacturing it. He hired friends of his. The company's breakthrough came when Rubin invented a convector radiator, which distributed heat through coils of copper tubes and thin metal fins. And it was useful, particularly when the hot summers of the 30s came along, because they converted it to uh, air conditioning. Train soon became a leading manufacturer of heating and cooling systems, and eventually grew to be the largest builder of central air conditioning systems in the world. The collapse of the lumber industry highlighted the need to conserve local resources, like Grandad Bluff, a towering local landmark. A stone mining company, chipping away at the bluff, was about to expand its operations. Ellen Hickson, the widow of lumberman Gideon Hickson, led a campaign to purchase the bluff and preserve its sweeping view for future generations. Other lumbermen and their families had already donated land along the river and where abandoned sawmills still stood. The city commissioned noted landscape architect John Nolan to design a park system for the city. He began with what is now called Riverside Park, guaranteeing that the area where Nathan Myrick built his cabin would continue to serve as the city's front door.
But as parks developed along the water, the Mississippi faced new threats from drainage of wetlands for farming and pollution of the water. Pollution in the Mississippi has become so horrendous from garbage, from human waste. In fact, a young boy from La Crosse dies as a result, they say, of exposure to the Mississippi River from swimming in the river. So conservationists start saying, you know, it's time to, th to think about this river differently. In 1921, a group of anglers from the Isaac Walton League, an early conservation group, went fishing on the Mississippi, where the group's leader, a Chicago advertising man named Will Dilg, was trying to figure out a way to stop a huge wetland drainage project south of La Crosse. One day he was fishing off a wing dam, and he turned to the person next to him and said, you know, we can make this whole dang thing into a fish and wildlife refuge and save the fish and wildlife in the Mississippi. And so Dilg starts one of the first powerful environmental campaigns in America. And by 1924, he succeeds when Congress creates the Upper Mississippi National Wildlife and Fish Refuge. It's gonna be 261 miles long, basically from Wabasha all the way to Rock Island, Illinois. And, and La Crosse is right in the heart of that. Creation of the refuge was an early success in a long effort to clean up and protect the Mississippi, and came at a time when it seemed the river would never again become a major shipping channel. The wing dams have really failed to bring commerce back to the Mississippi. Uh, the river just gets too low in the fall, there's too many drought years, and it just doesn't work. There's no through commerce. There's no boats that go from St. Louis to St. Paul, and the Midwest faces pretty important decision. And that decision is, do we want to be connected to the world through the Mississippi River or not? Navigation boosters said yes and pushed to bring shipping back, this time by building a series of locks and dams that would hold water back to create a nine-foot deep channel. The massive public works project would, once again, radically alter the Mississippi and create the multi-purpose river we know today. Now used as a major shipping channel, the river also serves as a recreation area. And as a wildlife refuge, the river provides a major bird migration route and a home for hundreds of species of fish and wildlife. New institutions of higher education played a huge part in the reinvention of La Crosse as the city became a college town. The La Crosse Continuation and Adult School began in 1912, part of Wisconsin's pioneering system of technical and vocational schools, the first in the nation. With free tuition for city residents, the school met the needs of new businesses and industries, providing workers with the skills needed to adapt to the post-lumber economy. The director, John B. Coleman, packed the school with students of all ages by responding quickly to requests, organizing a class, or finding tutors for anyone who needed them. In the 40s, there was a national magazine, The Commonweal, that did a, a story about La Crosse as the city that went to school. There were so many adults going to school at night to improve their skills, improve their knowledge. The article reported that 9,000 students of all ages, one out of five city residents, attended the school that would go on to become Western Technical College. Across town, Viterbo University was one of several institutions established by the Franciscan Sisters of Perpetual Adoration. In 1865, Mother Antonia Herb of the Franciscan Sisters made a vow to establish the practice of never-ending prayer. She prayed to God and said that if he blessed their ministry, she and the community would build a chapel, the biggest and best that their means could afford. In 1901, the Franciscan sisters began construction of a masterpiece of church architecture, Mary of the Angels Chapel.
The skilled craftsmen of the Hackner Altar Company of La Crosse built the altars and provided stone carving and woodworking. Doing the cabinet work, the altars, the pews, the detail is, is just astonishing. A teaching order, the Franciscan Sisters also built the city's first school of higher education, the St. Rose Normal Institute, for training Catholic school teachers. After years of growth and improvement, St. Rose became Viterbo College in 1939, offering a four-year degree in teaching. The sisters also started the first hospital here, and in connection with that, in 1901, began the St. Francis School of Nursing, primarily to teach their own sisters how to be nurses. The University of Wisconsin La Crosse traces its roots back to 1909, when the La Crosse Normal School stood at the edge of town, the result of a long effort by the city to bring a state teacher's college to town. Every city was vying for a normal school because they realized, like the railroads, they would bring important economic development opportunities of just plain education for its citizens. It would be considered a college city. A second building would improve the facilities for what had already become its specialty, the training of physical education teachers. There was no one around town as Muscle Tech. The school soon grew to become a four-year college, and its physical education program would go on to receive national recognition, setting the stage for helping the city through some hard times ahead. In April of 1965, after a fire destroyed the facilities of WKBT-TV, the station reported from a makeshift studio the news of the day, a record high flood of the Mississippi River. Inundated a great portion of the city of La Crosse, particularly the low-lying area between the north and the south sides. A lot of businesses, a lot of old warehouses uh, had a lot of water standing in them. and. I, th I don't think anybody thought about it at the time, but it was kind of a seminal event in the sense that it, uh, the city fathers, the Chamber of Commerce, those types of folks decided that they wanted to rebuild La Crosse and rebuild it into something different. The move to rebuild came at a time when bad economic news was also flooding in, as many of the industries that defined the city's identity were closing. My father was a tool and die maker at Alice Chalmers. They made farm machinery. Uh, they closed in 68, 69. Uh, we used to have Northern Engraving on the north side. Uh, uh, Autolite Company, uh, they've closed. And uh, several other places, rubber mills, had employed a thousand people making boots. Uh, they're gone now. And so we've lost a lot of our big manufacturers. But one city industry, the G. Heileman Brewing Company, continued to grow. Company president Roy Cum devised a strategy to compete with the big national brewers by acquiring small local brands. Roy started by purchasing a small brewery on the eastern side of Wisconsin called Kingsbury. Kingsbury at the time was a very uh, popular priced, that means meaning cheap, uh, beer, which uh, gave Heilman a different segment of the market. That was just the start of what was to come because there were many, many more acquisitions over the next couple of decades. As it acquired small breweries nationwide, Heilemans continued to brew those local beers, holding on to each brand's loyal customers. As its fortunes grew, Heilemann helped to establish a new fall festival in La Crosse called Oktoberfest. The event was an immediate success and soon became a major attraction for the city. And as the festival grew, so did the Heilemann Brewery. In 1971, Russ Cleary took over the business, and Russ had much the same uh, inclination to acquire breweries, and Heilemann grew steadily and actually meteorically. And I think what was so interesting about that era is that it was almost like um, notches in the city's psyche as Heilman moved up from 
I think it was something like 37 to 17 and all the way up to fourth. Not all of the growth was with acquisitions either. Old Style became a very, very formidable brand. Pure brood in God's country. Heilemann developed the theme of God's country with ads connecting the beauty of the lacrosse area and the purity of its water with the quality of the product. A lot of Chicago people looked at this mystical product coming from somewhere in the Wisconsin woods and the Old Style brand really took off. If you lived here, wouldn't you brew the best beer possible just so you could stay? By the 1980s, however, there was a problem and that was there just weren't any more little breweries around to pick up. The business was over a billion dollars in sales at that time, so it was large, but it had also become a target for acquisition. Alan Bond, an Australian entrepreneur, announced that he was buying up Heilemann stock, taking control of the company, and adding it to his worldwide business empire. But overextended with debt, the Bond Corporation soon collapsed and brought the G. Heilemann Brewing Company down with it. Eventually, with local backing, the facility restarted with its original name, City Brewery, continuing an industry as old as the city itself. In 1965, while the flood crested at nearly 18 feet, WKBT also reported on the demolition of an old landmark, the county courthouse, built in 1903. And in the years after the flood, the La Crosse Redevelopment Authority began to buy up and tear down the old industrial buildings of the waterfront, eventually making way for a convention center and motels that would bring new life to the old downtown. When we rediscovered that Mississippi River about 40 years ago, we took the opportunity to demolish, revitalize, tear down, renew, and that gave us a tremendous kickstart in revitalizing our downtown area and our waterfront. A lot of things spun off of that. But when the old city hall was taken down, the pendulum of the wrecking ball began to swing the other way. Preservationists began organizing to save the next target of demolition, the old post office. People woke up and said, wow, this is the last really major building in the old Civic Center. They wanted to fight for this building. It was not to be. Despite strong efforts to save it, the old Romanesque landmark met with the wrecking ball. Though replaced with a more efficient building, remnants of the old post office remain, marking the beginning of a preservation movement that would save much of the old downtown business district. Even though that post office was not saved, there came out of it something very important, which I think is a respect for preserving history, for saving buildings. We have to make La Crosse into what's unique and what's special. It makes us a tourist destination, and we have thousands of jobs in the tourist industry in this area that brings in tens of millions of dollars from outside visitors to come here. But it also makes us people who live here proud of La Crosse, that we're preserving the best of our past, but we're not you know, living in the past. And I think that's what I really like about La Crosse, is we're preserving the past, but we're actually preparing ourselves for the future. Well, I think when you think about La Crosse today, you think about higher education. We have three wonderful institutions here, the University of Wisconsin La Crosse, the Terrible University, and Western Technical College, which bring about 15,000 students into this area each year. In the city of 53,000, that obviously has a dramatic impact. And then healthcare. Uh, Gunderson Lutheran is our number one employer with those 6,000 employees. St. Francis Hospital is around 3,000 employees. The Health Science Center, a joint project of the city's three colleges and two health care centers, now serves as a state-of-the-art research and teaching facility. Dramatic changes, and so we've gone from a really a manufacturing area to today to a high-tech uh, health care, higher education. and La Crosse continues to grow in other ways, as new immigrant groups take their place among the old. The La Crosse I grew up in is dead and gone. 
that cross of the 1940s, 50s, 60s is gone. It's history. It doesn't exist anymore. We're no longer just uh, Germans and Norwegians and Lutherans and Catholics anymore. We're much more than that. We have become part of the bigger world. And then for that, we ought to rejoice and celebrate. But for all of its growth, the city of La Crosse still draws inspiration from the river. We see ourselves as a river town, and I don't think that will ever change, because here we are nestled in this beautiful valley. People feel a kind of a home here. It's historically rooted, and even if they just moved here three years ago, they become historically rooted. And I think anybody who spends much time on La Crosse as a resident has a kind of connection to the river that they're not even aware of lots of the time. They go out and look over that river, and it's a, it's a powerful instinct. And one of the things that's been pointed out many times is when some of the businesses closed here, the big industries, Almost all of those people, even if they got offers to move elsewhere to a similar job, chose to stay. They could not imagine leaving. Principal funding was provided by Don and Roxanne Weber, Gail K. Cleary and the Cleary Cum Foundation, Charles and Sue Ann Gillat, and continuing their rich history of community support, Quick Trip, founded in La Crosse in 1965 and serving the needs of customers in neighborhood stores across Wisconsin and beyond. Additional support by Gunderson Lutheran Health System, Dahl Automotive of La Crosse and Unalaska, Sigurd B. Gunderson, Jr., Friends of Wisconsin Public Television, and the Wisconsin History Fund, supported in part by the National Endowment for the Humanities.